the presentation itself. The first part is uh, specifically on health policy and system research. And I will take you on how you prioritize and come up with an agenda, a research agenda, that the country can use. The second part of my presentation is a demonstration of how evidence and information can be used to address a health problem in this country. And through that, I will be presenting you the essential package of services. The decision made on information that we have to save as many lives as possible and design a package that can be delivered across the country. Um, so let me start a definition. Uh, I hope that the, the, the presentation will come. The health policy and system research is a field of science that seeks to understand and improve how societies organize themselves in achieving collective health goals and how different actors interact in the policy and implementation process to contribute health outcomes. The objective of any research, of course, is to improve the health system so that people's lives can be saved. Now, the health system, the characteristics of health system. So can you go to the next one? Um, the characteristics of the health um, uh, policy and system research is, first of all, it is transdisciplinary. Although majority of us sitting here, I understand, are coming from the uh, health uh, sector. But it also en encompasses economics, political science, sociology, anthropology, and management science. So dealing with public health is not only the business of health professionals, but a lot of other professionals and disciplines who contribute and participate. In health policy and system research, it uses, first of all, questions. You ask questions. It's a question-driven approach, not so much of a methodology that you have to use. It has an applied focus, not for the sake of conducting a research, but to solve a problem and address real-world issues contextualized in the environment, in the context of the country where the research was conducted. <clears throat> the spectrum of health research are usually divided into three main streams. The biomedical research, which is about the biology, the understanding of the biology of diseases, what causes them, how you can solve, and creating products that can be used. Those products could be medicines, vaccines, diagnostic and appliances. The second stream is health policy and system research, which is the focus of this meeting uh, today and, and focus of my presentation. This field um, objective is to understand how the interventions and the science and the knowledge that's known already can improve and can be introduced and translated into interventions that can maximize benefits. And in this field, field you have research on health policy management, its functions, effectiveness, efficiency, and all that. The last stream is social science and behavioral research. This is an area that's not neglected. Uh, it's neglected, I wanted to say. And it is a lot of many people who are not fully um, actually cognizant the contribution that other sectors can make in public health. Whether it is whether you are a social scientist or economist and, or, or a management specialist. It deals with equity, issues of access, lifestyle, whether you are a smoker or, um, um, or chew card, you know, in the case of Somalia, and all health-seeking behaviors. Why services that are available from both, you know, the, the, the public, particularly the public sector, and today we heard about COVID-19 vaccine. Why is this not being used? And what can we do? What, what are the determinants and what influences people not to use and seek um, the services um, that are available already. What's the problem here in Somalia? It's, there is an insufficient use of existing knowledge for enhancing health system performance. It's not so much the studies that have been carried out in the country, but the knowledge that's out, uh, out there, whether it was conducted outside this country or uh, elsewhere. There's also a lack of information of how our system currently is working. Is it delivering 
the services that are supposed to be, that the system is supposed to deliver. And why this is not happening? Also, when nobody is not available, it's not necessarily known to the policy makers, or even sometimes to, to the practitioners of public health. The knowledge is available, so it's not known, and they cannot therefore use it. Now, the availability of knowledge and its appropriate use are both associated with low capacity to produce and disseminate this research. And I think that's the Somali um, Health um, Journal, uh, Action Journal, is the role that's going to play. Although it is in English, I think summaries of those uh, studies could be made in local language so that a large you know, uh, audience of our public could understand. Research is not done only for scientists, for policy makers, but also for the public in large and for the communication, uh, for communicating what is possible uh, in the realm of affairs in our country. The goal, as I said, is uh, when you want to set a pri priorities or an agenda for health research, you have to identify, first of all, the neglected areas that are not researched and have not known uh, a lot of information from either the literature specific to the country and the context, and therefore, after you have to identify, then you have to invest in those research and then see um, that the research is focused in making a difference in the lives of people by way of improving health outcomes. Um, there's no one single tool. There are several that exist, and they are not all of them actually you know, uh, suitable in every environment. So countries can actually come up with their own way of setting priorities on their own approach. Somalia, like any other country, has a unique situation and a specific context. And we will see uh, the context that we are working on the communities that we serve, how they live, their customs and traditions, their beliefs, and those are necessary for us to understand better and provide those services. So therefore, it is a decision that has to be made by you um, uh, in a multi-sectoral approach and bring on board everyone and agree what are those uh, neglected areas that will require uh, research. The process is very important. It has to be transparent and inclusive. You have to involve other sectors. You have to involve even the policy makers from the beginning so that they know there is a question of, uh, you know, that's being addressed, a health problem issue through research, either generating knowledge or translating the existing knowledge to solve the problem. Um, but let me take to you one of those methodologies, which is called the three-dimension combined approach uh, matrix. But I will not go through the whole thing. I will take the health, you know, uh, the public health matrix uh, the, uh, dimensions. The first question, and I said it's a question-driven approach rather than um, methodology-driven. So the first question you should ask is, how big is the problem that you are trying to, to solve? So do we have information about its epidemiology, the magnitude, the burden of disease of that problem? And then uh, the, the next question you should ask, when you, when you found out the burden of disease, why do they persist if there are instruments, tools that are available? What is determining for this particular disease to persist and not to be addressed? For example, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of them. We have the tool. The vaccines, of course, they are coming in uh, drips and drafts, but still they are not, you know, the uptake is quite, you know, still low uh, in some regions, not everywhere. The question, the next question you should ask is, when, once you identify the problem, it, uh, to find out if there are uh, already enough um, knowledge about the interventions that can make difference, whether it is through medical, public health interventions or whatever, or even through behavioral change and social change. And you have to look then the cost of those interventions. If the solution is to design an intervention or whatever nature that could uh, be. So you have to look at its cost. If it, you cannot implement it because it's not affordable and it's not appropriate, then you, you will not be able to solve that uh, uh, problem. Um, and and I, as I said, the resource availability is very important because that will determine on how much you can act and um, uh, uh, implement the solution that you have found through this um, uh, research and evidence that you have generated. The stakeholders are many. 
But I would like to, and many of you, you know about this, but I would like to draw your attention of these four streams of research types, the role of the patient, the patient itself. You have to talk to the patient that you are going to serve, whether it's in the, in the particular area of the clinical management of diseases or in health service provisions. This is very important for the patient to be consulted or patient groups. In certain countries, they have patient groups that advocate for certain type of services and they have to be involved. They are a stakeholder. It's not always appropriate for us professional health professionals to say, we know your solution, we know your problem, we know the solution, so eat it, take it, you know. That's not how it works. You have to involve them, you have to convince them, and you have to take them as a partner in what you are doing. Um, the other point I want to mention is the regulatory bodies is very, are, are very important. The regulatory bodies, they are the ones who will look at these ethical goals and who have to approve any research that is concerned of human subjects. There's an ethical issue that you have to address, and that's very important. And today, those you know, um, uh, uh, regulatory bodies in our country, they are not as strong as European. In certain cases, they do not exist. So it's very unethical to carry out a research that you know um, concerns human subjects without, first of all, an approval by a board, but also without their consent to be carried out, even if it has to be non-invasive. So what seems to work, and it's already known, is we need to focus on current policies and health system problems, the bottlenecks of our health system, and have clear objective what we want to solve. Not everything we have to prioritize, what we would like to address. We should know which audience that we have to bring on board, and we should know their profiles. This, all the stakeholders I have mentioned, and particularly the leaders who make decisions on behalf of the of the, of the society they govern, so that they know what they are talking about when they make policies. It should not be an empty you know, uh, slogan. It should translate into resources, support, political commitment with resources, and a follow-up. Uh, we need to engage them, therefore, uh, very closely from the beginning of the process, as I said. But also, we have to invest heavily and, in, uh, and engage in communication. If those um, um, studies have been carried out and solutions to a problem that exists in the country have been found, why are these not known to the public or to the health professionals or to our policy makers? And therefore, communication is very important uh, uh, to um, uh, make a change. The challenge in Somalia is health is um, not uh, prioritized, it's not at the top of the agenda. Uh, there is a limited funding. Uh, I was very pleased to hear Her Excellency the Minister of her support to, uh, for domestic uh, resources to uh, be invested in this area. But also, since Somalia depends largely on foreign aid, the influence of international partners, whether it's positive or negative, is a reality that exists. And when the discussions for those of you who interact with our partners, what you will hear sometimes from them, not all of them, because there are partners who are supporting this meeting, the Swedish government institutions. But then you will hear them telling you, oh, there's an emergency, you are in an emergency context. It's not a priority for research. Uh, you know, address just what's known and feed the people, you know, or address their health problems. But that's why those stakeholders have to be brought on board and convince them that this is something that's very important. The other uh, bottleneck or, or uh, um, uh, issue that we have to deal with is the research environment. It's access in certain areas, and as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, the need for a fully functioning ethical review board that can be established and who can, you know, uh, look. The low capacity is something that is being addressed, and actually, this meeting today is a testimony that there is a certain capacity in our system, in our institutions, that can actually carry out the research that are required to solve our health problems. What are the opportunities that exist today? What's different to the opportunities is uh, there are some conditions that will allow us to really, you know, promote health research and obtain, you know, uh, uh, support and resources. Number one is the shift of the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. The goal number 3.8 is achieving about universal health coverage. And this word you will hear a lot the universal, it's a global commitment, 
uh, that the world has decided, and many countries may not actually achieve due to so many problems, but we hope that we will make an intent and a progress towards that goal. And I will explain you know, in, a, in a few minutes how we are going to achieve. There are also lessons that we have learned the pandemics, the recent pandemics, the, the Ebola, the COVID-19 pandemic, and other transpondary uh, threats that are threatening the health of our populations. This is an opportunity today. There, is, uh, there are a lot of resources, and we heard this morning from uh, Marin of the Swedish um, Public Health Agency the number of papers that are produced every month regarding, you know, concerning about COVID. So there, is a, there are resources, there is a focus, there is a renewed interest, and I think in Somalia also I, I have seen a lot of papers, uh, uh, you know, uh, published um, on, on COVID-19, particularly why the vaccine uptake is not is so low. So there is this growing also recognition to invest in health systems in fragile settings and conflict-affected countries in Somalia. The health sector is attracting, for your information, a lot of resources that we did not have access before. So we need to take advantage of those resources, whether they are, uh, you know, from our partners or from the private sector. Now, the next uh, few slides, I will show you how evidence is important to shape the kind of decision and action that you will take. And this is about the preparation and the development, the design of the essential package of health services. It's directly related to evidence, to information. It's not something that you just come up without doing proper analysis and understanding the problem that you are to, going to address. Now look, this is the, the, the data that we have from the SARA survey. This is the service readiness and um, uh, assessment that was done, the survey, in 2016. And it has produced this. This is in 2016, a lot of things have changed. And for your information, today, there is, a, there is already an advanced state of preparation to conduct the harmonized health facility survey, which will get more information that we did not have, and which will update this data that you see in front of you, this picture. But on average, there is only about 0.7 facilities for every 10,000 population of Somalia. And you see here the disparities between several you know, of our um, uh, regions that you show. But looking at this picture, which is again the tabulation of the data that was collected in 2016, you will see that majority of the facilities, and here I will, you, know, you should know that health service facilities or the private sector includes the pharmacies that are open everywhere. And we have to have to, have to include so that they are, because they are, a lot of the Somalis go to services to those areas. And this you see the concentration, and there's a reason for this. Because in 2016, accessibility in certain parts of the country was not, you know, actually um, uh, uh, as easy as it is today. But you see a large concentration from the central regions uh, to the north of those facilities, which I will show you in the next slide. Um, of the 3,282 private health facilities, majority of them are in three states. That's, that's not, a, you know, uh, uh, something new to you. And the reason is these are major population centers that are peaceful. Somaliland, Puntland, and Benadi Regional Administration. 58% of those are pharmacies, so almost 60% of these are pharmacies. And then the other, you know, uh, breakdown that you can see. Um, majority of them, nearly 80%, are in urban areas. Uh, very few in the rural areas. And then the, the density is about 2.2 um, uh, facilities per 10,000. Uh, population because the first one that I show you was the public sector, this is the private sector. And this translates to about 1.68 health facilities per 10,000 population. These are the services that where people go to seek health services. Now, how much our government spend in the health sector? Very, 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 very small. You will see here, um, Somalia, you know, majority, the, the, the orange color, relies on uh, um, you know, uh, foreign aid. But also, as a comparison to other countries, you will see a similar picture. But there is a high out of pocket payment. So who finances the health sector in Somalia? Actually, it is financed from out of pocket payment, contrary to the perception of other people who think that it's otherwise. Majority of our, of, of the, of the, our people, they pay out of pocket, 
which is not actually something that we should be proud of. So this study is publi was published, this is a Somali Health and Demographic Survey that was published in 2020. This is the national picture. You have a state-specific Somali Health and Demographic Survey, including Puntland, and you can uh, check it out and find out. So almost 50% is out of pocket, that as you can see. Um, and even in the nomadic communities, 26%, that it's quite substantial uh, population. But what, concern, what should concern policymakers and all of us are the 14% who either borrow money or who actually um, uh, sell their assets, whether it is livestock or land or house they, that they have to. Only 2% of our population have access to, uh, or half of households, so it's not a population, households to health insurance. Uh, the health seeking behavior, so obviously this you can see that the uh, high uh, wealth quant uh, quintiles are the ones who normally uh, uh, have access to the private sector, and that's where they, the way they first go. Um, the mortality data, I don't have to take you through a lot, but you know that Somalia, although from the last um, uh, 15, 20 years, they have halved the maternal mortality ratio, but it's still the highest, the second highest in the world today, 692 globally, uh, sorry, nationally. Uh, the coverage is very low. You see only about the birth, uh, you know, only 32% uh, of the births are attended by skilled um, uh, health uh, professionals. The immunization coverage is very low, and this is really very sad to see when this technology is readily available. The, um, the total um, uh, fully immunized child is only about in the teens, 12%, 11%, and that's quite you know, a, a miserable situation to be. The nomadic are the ones who are suffering both in terms of access to skilled birth attendance as well as immunization. Look at the percentage for the nomadic population of children uh, who are immunized, about 1%. Uh, the UHC effective coverage index is a measure of a number of, of uh, indicators that um, uh, in a scale zero to 100. And Somalia is the second lowest in the world uh, for, uh, which is about 24%. Now, what was the government response and why it, the essential package is important? The burden of disease. This data comes from the Global Burden of Disease uh, Network uh, from the University of um, the Institute of Health Matrix and Evaluation of Washington University in Seattle, United States. Um, the, Okay, uh, so the burden of disease in Somalia is dominated by communicable diseases, nearly 50%. But the non-communicable disease is increasing. It was 2017, two, no, 2020, it was 19%, and now it's 23%. And the two diseases that dominate mostly are hypertension and diabetes. Uh, and in the Somali Health and Demographic Survey, you will see the data collected from households that actually tell you what diseases they are now being treated, diagnosed by a doctor, and not only that, you know, they are dreaming of it. So this is the picture. Uh, maternal and neonatal deaths are 15% of the burden. Injuries and neonatal, you see the, the, the percentage. What are the diseases that, you know, uh, dominate? 85% of the year's life loss, this is a measure of premature deaths as compared to the life expectancy of the population. These 20 diseases are responsible, 85% of death and disability in this country. And therefore, if you look at them, the red color, these are infectious diseases for which we know the instruments, the tools, the, um, uh, that, that we can address, majority of whom are immunization. Now, we designed an immunization uh, uh, health service, and these documents are the ones who are informing what came out. The Somali Essential you know, uh, Package of uh, 2020 was a huge effort and a milestone that we have put together. But other documents, the second you know, uh, edition of the Health Sector Strategic uh, uh, Plan, which now has been revised, which we have the third one, and also the Somali Roadmap for Achieving. So we are not just working on a vacuum, but we are informed and guided by policy instruments and the strategic you know, decisions that the government made. What happened then in the package? 
it was designed in such a way that this package can be planned at the facility level. We have mapped the workforce that will be required to deliver those services across the five levels of the delivery system in the country. We have enough details, in, although in Somalia we are using public and private sector, and we are contracting a lot of NGOs. So this package will allow us actually to uh, contract NGOs to deliver a specific service in a place by the level of the healthcare that we have. The design also supports to address, as you have seen, all the high burden conditions uh, through simple low-cost interventions that have proven effectiveness uh, across the world. And we have sourced them from reliable uh, uh, inter uh, intervention packages. Now, what's different from this package from the previous one is because it links, it links uh, the services to all the delivery uh, channels. There are five delivery channels or platforms in the country from the community all the way to the uh, regional office. It easily communicates, the health workers can communicate what services are available to at what level and how it's being provided and who's providing it. But, but it also can be adapted to operationalize the package to different conditions, whether it's in the nomadic community and you decide through outreach services or mobile you know, clinics, or they are you know, the IDBs, the internally displaced population, or in the rural areas. Now, this is some of the structure that you will see. All these interventions from, come, come from the disease control priorities number three. These are highest priorities of intervention, has highly cost effective, which has been proven across the world, not necessarily in country, but everywhere in the world. And then the WHO, USC, Universal Health Coverage Compendium, that has over 3,000 interventions for which we have only chosen, together with these sources, about 412 interventions. Those interventions can be, we design in such a way that it can be introduced progressively, as we need to also educate and uh, find more resources uh, about the cost effectiveness. We have placed some of the interventions deliberately at a higher level of the healthcare system because they have a better chance to be implemented rather than the appropriate level because of lack of human resources at that level. But as the, as the system you know, strength, gets strengthened, then you can always move those interventions from those levels to a, to a higher level. This is how it looks, this is one page of the document I showed you from community level to all the way to the national. It is color coded and it will be easy for you to understand. If you see a red color, which not this one is orange, but there is a red color, these are interventions that are addressing the high burden of uh, disease that cause you know, uh, premature uh, deaths and disability. The orange color are those who exclusively, or what we call morbidity, because of their duration and severity, uh, and hence you know, the impact it can have to uh, people's production, school activism, and this is the, 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 that kind of thing. So that's how it is done. The final couple of slides are the costing. We costed this. We wanted to know how much it will cost for us and where we have this money. We used a tool called the One Health Tool um, for the scope of work, and we have, of costing, and we have used you know, that tool to measure and cost the program support that's needed, the human resource, logistics, supplies, medicines, and infrastructure support. We came up with three scenarios. We dropped the, first, the, the, the third scenario because it was costly and un unaffordable. And you have to have a reality check whenever you come and propose solution. If you cannot afford it, it will not be implemented. We have chosen these two, and particularly the first one, where contrary to uh, you know, the popular belief, we came up and costed all the interventions required as less than, uh, you know, per capita cost less than $10. Now, WHO recommends about $70, $80. Uh, uh, per capita. But this has been proven in Somalia itself, where the per capita cost to deliver those packages range from $7 to $19. So there will be variations, but on average, this is something that we can afford. And therefore, we have to be uh, uh, realistic in, 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 in uh, accepting what monies will be available. Now, what's important is, where is this money going to be spent? These are the levels of our healthcare system, the five delivery uh, platforms, 
and majority are going from district and below. And that's very important to the primary health care services. Uh, the system allows us to convince our uh, partners and our government if this money is made available, which today I can assure you is available, what impact would it have? What is, what is going to change? And what's going to change are the, um, are the mortality reductions that you see if we implement the maternal mortality will go almost half you know, uh, uh, of what uh, today's value is, and that's in a period of 10 years. I think it's a major progress if we do that. You see also the child mortality you know, uh, rates and its reduction and how it's going to impact. But these are the challenges that we need to address. There are limited institutional capacity in allocating most domestic resources, but also um, a high dependence of donor support and, and, and all others that you would hear. This has now been addressed through different strategies. Thank you.